Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Matt Williams. I'm a tutor in politics at the University of Oxford. And today I'm going to talk to you about how to stand out from the crowd when you're applying to the University of Oxford and submitting what's called a personal statement. Now, if you apply as an undergraduate to the University of Oxford, you have to fill in what's called a UCAS form, which stands for the University and Colleges Admissions Service form. And on that, there is a personal statement for which you have 4,000 characters to sell yourself. And one of the most common questions I'm asked is, well, how do you stand out from the crowd? How do you avoid thinking inside the box and think more outside the box? And in this lecture, I'm going to talk you through the key stages of how to achieve that. But the bottom line, and this is something I'm going to keep repeating through this lecture, is that you've got to be yourself. Your personal statement has got to be personal. If it's not, if it doesn't tell us about you, then it's not going to be a very helpful guide to us in making admissions decisions. I've been involved with admissions here at the University of Oxford for the last 10 years. I've got a lot of experience in it. I've read thousands of these personal statements. And the ones that stand out to me are the ones that I can tell are honest, that are true, that tell us a bit about the person. Okay, so before we get into how you actually do that, and I'm going to give you loads of worked examples, so this is going to become very, very clear. Let's talk about what not to do. What's the opposite of standing out? Well, it's anything where you're trying to hide yourself, where you're being a little bit passive. So rather than being active, you're telling us what other people think. You're just repeating what other people have read, what other people find interesting, what other people have done. Now, the reason that this is so problematic is because when you come to university, especially universities like Oxford, you have to be independent minded. You have to be self-motivated because a lot of the stuff that you'll learn, you're going to learn on your own. Okay, it doesn't matter what subject you're doing, whether it's mathematics or medicine or law or politics with me, you're going to have to do quite a lot of the spade work yourself. And so we're looking for people that have demonstrated that they can do that. Okay, we need some evidence that they can do that. We don't want people that just sort of say, I'm probably good at that. We need some proof, some absolutely concrete proof. But if someone sort of says, well, I've kind of done some things because someone told me to do them. I've, I've been thinking about things, but honestly, my thoughts are basically the same as everyone else's. That's a bit worrying because that gives us the indication that you're not going to cope very well with this very sort of independent minded, self-motivated process of study. Okay, so being too passive, thinking too, too inside the box is problematic. Similarly, being derivative and fundamentally being inauthentic, not being yourself. I think a lot of people don't really believe me when I say this, but we want to get to know you, right? The University of Oxford and similar universities are not looking for some sort of cutout student who looks like all the other students we've got. We, we like disruptors. We like people that are intellectually liberated, that they think for themselves. This might sound a bit odd because, you know, you, you might imagine that we are looking for some sort of archetypal student that's cut from a mould. But the best students can't be cut from a mould because they are, they are trying to help us see the world differently. And so it's those people that can think for themselves. And that counts across the board. It doesn't matter if you're applying for mathematics. If you've looked at a proof in mathematics and you thought of ways that it can be approved, nah, that's what I'm talking about. Because you're thinking for yourself. You're not just being passive. You're not being derivative of someone else's th thinking. And you're not fundamentally being inauthentic. You are standing out. You're not a part of the crowd. You're not one of the herd. You are, to use this this tortured metaphor, outstanding in a field of your own choice. And that is honestly what we want. We want your personal statements to be personal. Those are the best ones, I promise you. Okay, so imagine that the personal statement is an interview that's being committed to paper, to about 4,000 characters. So the core questions you're gonna be answering in that are, what do you want and why do you want it? And fundamentally, what have you done? Now, in order to stand out and to not look too passive or too derivative, you need to tell us things that are super curricular. Okay. Now, if curricular describes anything that you're doing as part of your school work, school or college work, right? Your, your, your studies in order to obtain your high school qualifications. In the UK, those might be A-levels or the International Baccalaureate. Okay. That is curricular information. We don't need any of that. We've got loads of it on the rest of your personal statement. If you tell us, for example, that you're studying further maths and maths and physics in your personal statement, you're wasting characters because we've seen that already. It's already written down all of your qualifications. So don't bother with that. We don't need curricular information. We need super curricular information. What have you done to demonstrate your interest in your subject that goes beyond what you've done in school, beyond what some teacher has told you to do, what you have done, what you've taken the initiative to do for yourself. That's what we want information about. Okay, we're also, 
and this comes as a bit of a surprise to some people, not terribly interested in extracurricular information when it comes to the University of Oxford. Now, extracurricular is that which you do outside of your school curriculum, but it has no bearing on your academic interests. So that would include things like sport, possibly music, unless you're applying for music, drama, stuff like that. At Oxford, we don't care about that stuff, I'm afraid. So regardless of whether you're head of your school, or you played you know, football for your county, that's all great. Don't stop doing it, but it's not gonna help you get into Oxford. It can help you get into other universities in the UK. And you've got to remember that that UCAS personal statement is being sent to all of the universities you applied for, up to five. So do keep in some extracurricular information. And the rough rule of thumb is 80-20. 80% supercurricular, 20% extracurricular, and basically none of it needs to be intracurricular or curricular. None of it needs to describe what you're actually studying in school because we already have all the data we need on that. Okay, so what do you want to do from now is the key question. Why do you want to do it? And what have you done about it? What evidence do you have? Okay, and going a bit deeper, if you want to think about, well, what can I talk about? What, what do I want to do? Because people are quite understandably uncertain, maybe even a bit ambivalent about what they are interested in. That's normal. But you need to think about what makes you happy and pursue that. Scratch some itches. If you've got some questions about the subjects that you're applying for, great, pursue those. You know, and, and these are the four most commonly heard words in, in this order that you'll hear at, at university. What do you think? Okay, what do you think? If you can start telling us what you think in your personal statement, then you look like you're ready to go. You look like you're gonna step through the doors of my university, my university, our university, <laughs> and you're just gonna get it from day one. You're absolutely gonna nail it because you think for yourself. You're not just passive. You're not just waiting for someone to tell you what to do. You're already doing it yourself, okay? So let's make this all a lot more concrete. Well, actually, first of all, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. You can ask a philosophical question about whether we can be original, and honestly, I think you can. You know, you are, you are definitionally unique, right? And although you will be influenced by other people's thoughts and feelings, if you pursue your own interests, it's guaranteed that they will be your own, okay? And it's guaranteed that you will therefore stand out. So the, the most surefire way of standing out from a crowd is just being yourself, not pretending to be someone else, not trying to be this perfect Oxford student, because that person doesn't exist. And if they do exist, they are a disruptor. They're someone that thinks for themselves, they don't just go with a crowd. Okay, so we don't want someone that's pretending to be someone they're not. If you, you're, you, if you are yourself, you will be original. Okay, it's guaranteed. So how do you concretely do it? Well, first of all, be yourself. Nice sort of aphorism, not particularly useful. So what do I concretely mean by that? Well, be honest. You know, tell us what you've done uh, and take some initiative. If you haven't done enough, take some initiative. And everything that I'll be talking about, by the way, provided you have, it, have access to the internet, is free. You do not need any experiences that you would have to pay for, nor do you need to be embedded in some sort of elaborate network of powerful people, you know, with your neighbor being a brain surgeon and your cousin being a high court judge or whatever. None of that's required. All of the experiences I'll be talking about are freely available online, okay? But you've got to take a bit of an initiative, right? If we, we've got some very competitive degree programs at Oxford, if you want to, to prove that you're the person that deserves it the most, you've got to do the hard yards. You've got to actually provide some evidence that you deserve it, okay? So do some things. If you're not sure that you've got enough to say on your personal statement, fix that, okay? And here's some examples of how you can fix that. So I should note that all of these little excerpts of personal statements were written by me, so they're not real in that sense, but they are based off my experience of reading thousands of personal statements. So they are a realistic appraisal of what makes for a good personal statement. And I have read examples very, very similar to these. So these are not sort of ridiculously out of someone's reach either as a sort of 17, 18 year old. Anyway, here's a possible example from English literature. And I'm gonna to have to wear my glasses because I'm half blind, so bear with me here. So, <clears throat> it is difficult to pinpoint when I fell in love with literature, but Chaucer's Wife of Bath settled my mind in applying to study it at university. To show proper wifely grief, the woman pretends to cry at her fourth husband's funeral. Uh, the woman chose to be a wife for her own sake, not her many husbands. I could instantly relate to her sense of self, despite the gap of seven centuries between us. Okay, so why is this good? Well, first of all, it's super curricular. I don't think there are uh, curriculums, A-level English literature curriculums that include Geoffrey Chaucer in them. I'm not sure, but 
it seems pretty clear that this is someone that is just reading stuff because they are interested in. They, they wondered, oh, I don't know what all the fuss is about with Geoffrey Chaucer, I might pick it up and have a try. And they looked into it and they found it really interesting. Great. That what they've not done is provided loads of examples, right? I think some people think that your personal statement has to be so densely packed with hundreds and hundreds of different things you've read. No, 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 we'd much prefer you to tell us about yourself and therefore give yourself a little bit more space to explain what you did and what you thought about it and some of that self-reflection so that your personal statement becomes tr truly personal. And that's what this person does. I read The Wife of Bath and here's what I found interesting about it. And this is sort of evidence that I am a serious English literature student. This is evidence that if you admit me, day one, I'm going to love going to the library. I'm going to love going to those lectures. I'm going to love writing essays because I've basically been pretending to be a university student for the last year. It's been great. Okay, so this is very reassuring for, for an admissions tutor. Here's another example from uh, computer science. Now, computer science is not always studied by students before they come to universities like Oxford. And it's an example of a, of a degree program, therefore, like medicine, like law, like engineering, where students are coming in to a certain extent cold in the sense that they don't have any prior formal tuition in those subjects. And that's fine, by the way, provided you meet the eligibility criteria. But we are still going to need a bit of evidence that you're serious, right? If you're about to apply for a subject you've never formally studied before, how do you know what you want to do it? And how should we believe you when you tell us you want to do it? Well, here's an example of how, how you can give us some reassurance. I'm applying to study computer science because it is so interesting to me. Now, that's fine. That's a very common sort of statement that you get in personal statements, but we need proof, right? Talk is cheap. Don't just tell us you're interested. Give us some proof. Here's the proof. I became particularly interested in artificial neural networks when I tried to speak to a computer and could not figure out how automated speech recognition worked. Since then, I have written some natural language processing programs in Python, and I have read about the activation functions used for speech recognition. I still have a lot to learn, and I cannot wait to learn it. Okay, now, <clears throat> so again, this is someone who's saying they're interested in computer science. Crucially, they're proving it because they've gone and looked into some stuff. And they've not gone and looked into some stuff because some teacher was craning over their neck and said, you better look into the activation functions of speech recognition programs and you better start practicing them in Python. No, this is someone that sort of said, this sounds kind of cool. I'm interested. I want to go and find out about it. By the way, this all looks quite advanced and technical and difficult, but it's not. You can find YouTube videos on this that would explain all of these sorts of details. And what we're not looking for is someone who is already you know, a brilliant computer scientist. We know that you're here to, you're coming to Oxford to be educated. So not being entirely sure about the subject is fine. Dipping a toe in the water is fine. Provided that you tell us what you've done and what you took away from it, what you learned from it. That's what we're looking for. Bit of personality in your personal statement, you're bound to stand out. That's the, the trick. Okay, now to what extent do you need to sell yourself? Now I'm commonly sort of, asked, do I need to sort of be really like, mm, you know, have a bit of swagger and sell myself like I'm a you know, used car salesman? The answer is not really, no, because your experiences will sell themselves. You don't need to sell yourself. You don't need to sort of put on some sort of airs of arrogance and uh, self-possession, which you may not have. In fact, Brits commonly find this really awkward, you know, having to sort of say I'm brilliant doesn't come terribly naturally to us as a, as a nation and it's not required, okay? So if you're a naturally quite diffident person, you don't need to be all sort of brash and braggadocious. You can just tell us what you've done because the experiences will speak for themselves. Indeed, it's, there's no harm in actually showing a little bit of intellectual vulnerability and acknowledging what you don't know. I think another thing that people are convinced of is that you have to sort of pretend as if you're bulletproof intellectually and that there's nothing wrong with you. Here's an example from chemistry, okay? I secured, oh, hang on, I secured a silver award in the 2021 Chemistry Olympiad. I was pleased with the result, but felt I could do better. As such, I looked into some of the questions I struggled with, especially those relating to calcium looping technology, as I have a particular interest in climate change mitigation. Okay, lots of good stuff going on here. So the person saying that they got a silver award, now of course you can get a better prize than that, you can get the gold award, but silver in the Chemistry Olympiad is, is a good performance, okay? And they've acknowledged that they were pleased with the result, but they felt they could do better. Because of course, you can always do better, right? Even if you'd got the top mark in the Chemistry Olympiad, even if you got gold, you could still be better. And that sort of sense of hunger for more, that's really reassuring. 
because what we often find in Oxford is people that are a little bit complacent, they've perhaps been at or near the top of their school for years and they just think they're the bee's knees, they don't need any tuition, they're perfect, but no one's perfect, you can always be better. And so someone that acknowledges that is, is useful. It's not required, so don't feel you have to sort of shoehorn in some sort of intellectual vulnerability. The point I'm trying to make is that it's not going to do you any harm if you tell us what you've done and you tell us about your, your story, your journey. So this person's then specifically looked into calcium looping technology. Uh, I have a particular interest in climate change mitigation. So this person's also given me a lot to talk about in an interview, which is quite handy. Should I wish to use the personal statement in the interview, which is not uncommon, it's not guaranteed, but it's not uncommon, then we've got some stuff to talk about because we've got a person that's taken an interest. If someone tells me in their personal statement they've done something that everyone else has done, they've read the same books everyone else has read, they've you know, done the same modules for their school, it's going to be much harder to actually gauge what makes this person tick, what makes them motivated, because they've not really given us any information on that. So this is why this particular excerpt works quite well, but others tend to be a little bit flat because they're inauthentic, they're passive, and they're quite derivative. Okay, here's an example from law, same sort of, same sort of idea. idea. I attended the Crown Court in my nearest town to better understand the justice system. Entirely free, by the way. If you live near a town and you want to get information on the justice system, going to the court and being an observer is a good idea. Some courts around the world now televise their proceedings and put them on YouTube. So like I said, a lot of free stuff out there. Don't feel like you have to pay money or be sort of hooked into some great network to, to be able to get these experiences. Anyway, I'll carry on. At first, I have to admit that I could not understand what the barristers were aiming at with their cross-examinations. As such, I read more about advocacy and started to appreciate the skills on display. So this is someone that's telling us about their intellectual journey. They're telling us about the beginning, the middle, and not the end, but you know how they're sort of progressing. Great, this is really useful, okay? It's telling us about someone that's taken some initiative. They've decided, I wanna find out more about this and they've gone and done it. They've looked at it for themselves. They haven't waited for someone else to tell them to do it. It's a personal statement as a consequence. Far too many applicants to universities like Oxford are waiting for someone else to tell them what to do. Tell me what I should read. Tell me what I should experience. Tell me this, tell me that, tell me the other. And then we come along every sort of you know 20 or so applications, someone who says, oh, I, I was interested in this, and so I, I went and did it. I took the initiative. Oh, great. You know, that's the sort of person that's going to stand out. Okay. So I know that takes a bit of confidence, but I'm giving you the confidence now, I hope, because I'm telling you, you're already an original, you're already unique and you should, you should exploit your interests, right? Trust in your interests because they are, they'll serve you well. I think a lot of people come into this process far too insecure thinking that they aren't good enough and they aren't going to be taken seriously enough. But if you just pursue what, you're, what makes you happy, not only will you enjoy it more, but you'll be more interesting, okay? But it is worth noting that you should stretch yourself, okay? So don't make your life too easy. It's a good idea to pretend, basically, that you're a university student when you're doing these super curricular activities. So try and make sure that you read uh, or watch or listen to stuff that is at a university level. And that's pretty easy to find. Universities publish a lot of stuff on YouTube. They publish a lot of public facing blogs and other materials. There's a lot out there these days that is easy to access so that you know what a university level is like. You can even find reading lists for many undergraduate courses just freely available online. Uh, so, you know, make sure that you're not making your life too easy. Okay, so here's an example for someone who's possibly applying to study Japanese. And it's not at all unusual for people applying to study Japanese to have never studied Japanese formally before. So they're in a, they have a particular sort of responsibility to prove to the admissions tutors that they are ready for a degree in Japanese. And so this person gets, although I'm not currently studying Japanese at school, I wanted to be absolutely sure that I really wanted to study it. So I found a bilingual copy of Rashomon, which is a story and worked slowly through the phonetic Japanese and an English translation. I could tell that the English version loses so much of the original's beautiful imagery and phonology. Okay, so again, this is someone who's taken a bit of an initiative. They have found some things. Presumably by taking the initiative and exploring the proverbial sandbox of Japanese culture, they found a few things that were not interesting to them. They tried a few things out, mm, not so sure, put it down, moved on. That's fine, okay? You know, as part of that exploration there will be a few dead ends where you won't find a great deal but this person has 
has found a resource that they found particularly useful and interesting. Rashomon is a fascinating story. Uh, it's also a film uh, made by Akira Kurosawa. And so this is someone that is serious and they're not just wasting everyone's time by saying, oh, I think I want to do Japanese. I've kind of done what everyone else does when they're about to apply for Japanese, like watching some anime and, some, and reading some sort of basic textbooks. This is someone that's stretching themselves. They are serious. They are pretending to be a university student. And by going through that process, having that experience, they're giving me a lot of reassurance. Okay, what else should you do? You should share yourself. Now, this is basically the undergirding point I've been making throughout, but you've got to tell us more about what you think. Okay, this is crucial to not being too derivative, too passive. If you read some things, or if you listen to some things, or you watch some lectures on YouTube or whatever, tell us what you thought about it. Don't just tell us you did that thing. Don't just say, I read a book. Tell us you read a book and then what you thought about it. What were your conclusions? What were your takeaways? What do you think could be improved about the work? Okay, you don't need to be a critic. You don't need to say, oh, I read this book and it was a load of trash. I hated it, <laughs> cover to cover. You know, that's not required. Indeed, that would come across as a little bit brash and, and un unhelpful. But what you can do is just to start saying, you know, honestly, what did you think? Honestly, what did you think? Because remember, those are the most common words you'll be asked at university. What do you think? All right, so here's an example from history. I loved Peter Frankopan's Silk Roads. Now, the reason for choosing this is because it's a very commonly cited book. It's a very popular history book. And so we see it crop up quite often in personal statements. I love Peter Frankopan's Silk Roads, but I would like to know more about how goods, technology, and ideas were traded with Africa. That continent, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, is not much studied in sweeping histories of the world. I've therefore read about the Kingdom of Benin and its importance to the story of civilization. The problem, as I see it, is that many such histories were produced in Europe during the colonization of Nigeria. Okay, so this is great because they've started with a bit of an on-ramp saying, I read a popular history book. Now, typically if I'm an academic and I see, and I see someone's reading popular histories, I sort of think, mm, are they that serious? Are they stretching themselves? But they basically said, this was my way in to more challenging, more interesting territory. And in particular, the, 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 the position of Africa in sort of pre-industrial globalization, which is a really fascinating topic. And they've started sort of exploring uh, about the Kingdom of Benin, which is in modern day Nigeria, not in the country Benin. Uh, and so they're trying to find out more about its position in global networks. Fascinating, okay? So they've not just said, I read a book, I read Peter Frankopan, like everyone else has done. They've told us where that took them on their journey, which is great, okay? So that's the sort of thing, you know, while you're reading, think about how could this be better for me? How could I improve this? Now, you don't need you don't need to read and say how is this book terrible you know you don't need to sort of be concluding that the book isn't any good because that's not required and it's not realistic you just need to tell us what you would like to do to take it further now here's an example for medicine just to show you that independent mindedness and personality are important for the science subjects as much as they are for the humanities and social sciences okay uh, to better understand the COVID-19 lockdown, I read the Report 9 paper on non-pharmaceutical interventions published by Imperial in March 2020. So just as a bit of context, that was the paper that led to lockdown and social distancing in the United Kingdom. It, it advised the government to implement those policies. They used a simulation of individual behaviour derived from influenza pandemic planning. This was completely reasonable, but it made me think about how future pandemic modeling will be influenced by COVID-19. I also think group simulations will be needed in future to understand vaccine hesitancy and other forms of group think. Okay, so again, this is someone who's telling us that they've read some papers, absolutely freely available. You can find this paper by Googling it. It's a fascinating medical science paper, and it shows that this is someone that's a serious, you know, prospective undergraduate because they basically pretended to be an undergraduate. They're reading academic papers, which is what undergraduates do every day. So this is a serious contender, but even better than just reading the paper passively and saying, oh, I agree with everything. They've also told us what they thought about it, told us where they thought it could be improved. Now that presumably will have taken quite a long time. Those academic papers, if you, if you don't have any medical science training, are, are tough going, right? They're, they're not easy. So what we don't want is a sort of a very long list of things you've read 
If you take a few things to read and take your time to think about them, even if it takes you a couple of weeks to work out your views or how you might improve things, perhaps read some other stuff to find out what other people think, but ultimately settle on your own views, great, you're going to come up with some much more interesting stuff that we can talk about in interviews potentially and that demonstrate that you, are, you have a personal view on this and therefore you have written a personal statement. I can't underscore that point any, any more clearly. Okay. Finally, you need to make sure that you discipline yourself. So what I might mean by this is to make sure that you're clear what it is you actually need to say and what you don't need to say. So as mentioned earlier, we need information on your super curricular activities, being those which pertain to what you've done beyond your school curriculum that is relevant to your academic interests. Other universities besides Oxford will also have some interest in your extracurricular activities, but as a rule of thumb, 80% supercurricular, 20% extracurricular will be fine for all universities. Another thing to consider is that given you're applying to lots of universities, what you don't want to do is to write a personal statement that is geared to any one specific institution because that could cause you trouble. You need to make sure that all of the admissions tutors at all of those five universities are going to be happy reading your personal statement. Now this can be problematic if you're applying for something, a course that is unique to a particular university. So for example at Oxford the course I tend to teach for is called Philosophy, Politics and Economics or PPE. And that's a relatively unusual degree. It's not completely unique, but it's not far off it. And most of the people that apply for PPE at Oxford are also applying for other degrees, such as just straight single honours economics or single honours politics or philosophy at other universities. And so in their personal statement, what they must not do is write, I want to study PPE, because all the other universities will just think, well, OK, you want to go to Oxford, you're not interested in us, so we're not interested in you and they'll just ditch your your applications. It's a very dangerous thing to do. So what you need to do is to find the common denominator of all the subjects you're applying for. You don't need to explicitly name check all of the subjects that you are hoping to cover in any given degree. And so let's say for example that you're applying to study economics at all of the universities and PPE at Oxford. So how can you write a personal statement that pleases everyone? Well, economics, of course, often intersects with philosophy and politics anyway, but you don't need to say so explicitly. So here's an example. I researched the trading of carbon offsets as part of an independent study project. Incidentally, independent study projects, things like your EPQ, which is the Extended Project Qualification, or the Welsh Baccalaureate Independent Study Project are great, and they are super curricular. Even though you do those things as part of your school curriculum, you're the one that determines the content. So it is technically super curricular, and we love hearing about it. Anyway, I researched the trading of carbon offsets. Uh, the differential price for carbon in different regions is a predictable consequence of economic forces, but it also disincentivizes climate change action and is arguably unjust for those poorer countries that are encouraged to pollute for the benefit of richer countries. So this is fundamentally someone who's writing about an economic phenomenon, trading of carbon offsets, but they are clearly speaking to matters that are of relevance to political scientists, because this is a policy problem, it's a power dynamics going on, but also they are speaking to philosophers because you know they're saying this is arguably unjust. Okay, but without explicitly having to say, and I am interested in philosophy, and I am interested in politics, they've said it in words without explicitly having to use the names of the subjects. Okay, so that's what I mean by discipline yourself. You don't need to be so clunky with your language a lot of what you'll say will be easily inferred from the content of what is written. Okay? Another thing to discipline yourself with is, is the style of language. Um, you can use words of two syllables. You don't need to use long flowery language. You don't need to use jargon. You just need to explain your interests as if you were talking to a friend or a family member who is not an expert in, in the field. Okay? You also can keep your, your, your language plain and unadorned and that's to your benefit because you've only got 4,000 characters to play with so you've got to be pretty sort of efficient in how you communicate. If you use lots of flowery descriptions you're just wasting your character length and that means you've got less to talk about. So what I've got here is again from the Japanese example is side by side comparisons of exactly the same content but one version stripped down and the way I stripped it down was that I cut out all of the adverbs and adjectives and some determiners. Those are the parts of speech that you can almost always cut out without loss of meaning. And you can save an awful lot of, of character space by doing so. 
So here's the original version. Although I'm not currently studying Japanese at school, I wanted to be absolutely sure that I really wanted to study it. You know, things like absolutely and really, you don't need to say that. So I found a bilingual copy of Rashomon and I worked slowly, slowly is another ad adverb, through the phonetic Japanese and an English translation. I could tell that the English version loses so much of the original's beautiful imagery and phonology. Okay, here's the stripped down version. I'm not currently studying Japanese at school, so to test my interest, I found a bilingual copy of Rashomon. I worked through the phonetic Japanese and a translation. The English version loses the original's imagery and phonology. Now, I'm not saying you can't have any adornment. So, you know, if you wanted to say that you thought the original's imagery and phonology were indeed beautiful, that's fine. So you don't need to sort of completely bleach it of any, <laughs> of any sort of ornamentation. If you can bleach an ornament, anyway. I'll stop mixing my metaphors. But what I'm saying is that a lot of the time, just because we, we write in the way we speak, we tend to sort of put in filler words, which are a bit waffly and kind of unnecessary. And we take the word very, for example, you almost never, never need to use the word very, okay? <laughs> if you're communicating your ideas clearly enough, it's rarely necessary to say very. Now, I'm not saying you should sort of never say it and that it's, that I never say it, but just be conscious of that fact. Be conscious of how often we, we waste language by using sort of redundant verbiage in order to pad things out. And when you don't have much space to work with, you've got to be really aware of that potential problem. Okay, so to just recap on some of the key things and to finish us off, be yourself, right? If you want to stand out from the crowd like this person is in their outstanding in a field of their own choice, literally, you've got to be yourself, okay? Your personal statement has got to be personal. And if it's got personality, if it tells us about your interests and your experiences, it can't help but stand out. And that's what I want. I'm looking for prospective students that know what it's like to be a university student. And being a university student means standing on your own two feet, taking some initiative, not being passive, not being too derivative. Okay, that also means you need to invest in yourself. So if you're a bit worried you don't have a great deal to say, you need to go and get those experiences. You need to get those those skills. So go and explore, go and work out what do you find interesting. If you're applying for a subject like engineering, well ask yourself why am I applying for this? What do I like about it? What do I find interesting? Go and search the internet for stuff that you can explore in greater depth in regards to that subject. Okay? In the process you are bound to empower yourself because you'll enjoy it. I mean one of the key bits of advice I have is that if you're not having fun, you're not doing it properly. So have as much fun as possible because people that are having fun do everything better, okay? If you're doing stuff because you just find it a, a burden and a labor, oh, I'm still working my personal statement, uh, then you're not doing it right, okay? <laughs> We're not looking for sort of people that hate their subject but are sort of scra scraping their way through just to get to Oxford. You know, we want people that have some joy in their hearts that have actually really enjoyed what they've been doing. That is perfect for us, okay? And remember, the four most common words you're gonna be asked at university, regardless of what subject you apply for, is what do you think, okay? So if you can start demonstrating you have independent thoughts now, it's gonna be incredibly reassuring to admissions tutor like me. Anyway, if you've made it this far through the video, well done you, you have fantastic stamina. Um, thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, then do please stick them below and I will get to them as soon as possible. Thank you ever so much for watching and I wish you all the best in your applications. Thanks so much. Bye now.